How does the computer work? It's a question I frequently ask myself. Unfortunately, it's a big question and I don't know the answer yet. I can, however, try to narrow down my question to something a bit more specific. How does the computer make Elden Ring go? Even more specifically, how does it project 60-ish 3D images to my 2D screen with all its shading and textures and lights? In this video, which will hopefully be the first in a series, I will be trying to figure out just this. We're going to look on a super low level at what exactly is happening behind the scenes in a graphics API such as OpenGL or Vulkan. Essentially, I want to take you from maybe knowing nothing about how graphics are drawn to your screen, to maybe knowing something about how graphics are drawn to your screen. First things first, a few basics. In 3D graphics, we aim to render, which is the process of drawing a 3D object onto your screen, meshes onto our screen. You can think of meshes as essentially a list of 3D points, each with an X, Y and Z value, called vertices. We aim to colour in between the vertices to render our mesh. Ok, so let's get started. The first thing we might want to figure out how to create is a wireframe render, like this. To do this, we need to figure out how to join our vertices with lines, introducing Bresenham's line algorithm, which will figure out exactly which pixels need to be coloured between two 2D points on our screen, from x1y1 to x1y2. And don't worry, we will come back to the third z point later. We're also going to use a few assumptions. The line is going from left to right and bottom to top, and the gradient is between 0 and 1. Essentially, we want our algorithm to loop through every x pixel, determine the y value, and then colour the pixel accordingly. To find the y value of our next pixel, there are a couple things we can do. We can either pick the pixel to the right of our current pixel, or we can pick the pixel to the top right of our current pixel. But how do we choose? We can use something called the error to determine which option to pick. The error is essentially how far away the actual line is, away from the centre of the pixel on the screen. We calculate this by taking the Y position of the line and subtracting the Y value of the next pixel. We check the error for the pixel to the right of our current pixel, and if the error is larger than one half, we go to the top right. If the error is less than one half, it's best to just go right. So here the error is less than one half, so we just fill the pixel to the right. And here the error is more than one half, so we fill the pixel to the top right. Now we know where to draw the next pixel for each point in our line, so we can just do it over and over again until the line is complete. One important thing about the algorithm is that it uses only additions and minuses to calculate all this, making it faster than other algorithms which use expensive divisions. So now if we apply the algorithm for all the x and y vertices in a mesh, once again just ignoring the z-axis for now, we get this. Wowee, that was a lot of maths that I didn't understand a, even just a day ago, and to be honest I only somewhat understand it now. Unfortunately, that won't be the last because now we need to figure out how to fill these triangles in. Unfortunately, that is easier said than done. To understand this, we will start with just one triangle that has the points A, B and C. We can start by just drawing lines between them using the algorithm. So in order to fill in the triangle, we're going to need to start by saving all the pixels on our lines in a list. To do this, we will save each X position with the same Y position. So for Y8, there are two pixels at X5 and X6. For Y7, there are also two pixels at X5 and X6. For Y6, there are two pixels at X4 and X7. And so on until we have done this for all of our pixels. Once we have all of our lists of X values, we can save all of these in one big array. We can now access all of the X coordinates around the edge of the triangle with their associated Y coordinate. This makes it super easy to fill in our triangle using the line algorithm. All we have to do is draw a line between the first and last X coordinate for each Y value. 
So for the first line, y8, we draw a line between the coordinates 5, 8 and 6, 8, which doesn't actually do anything because there isn't a gap. Uh, same for the pixels, we draw at y7. For y6, we draw between the coordinates 4, 6 and 7, 6, which fills in two pixels, and we just carry on until the triangle is filled. This algorithm is called the line sweep algorithm because it sweeps draw lines all over the triangle a bunch. There are many other techniques which are used to rasterize triangle, and I'm sure others are much faster, but this one was definitely the easiest for me to understand. Okay, so now we know how to draw a single triangle, we can just do this for all of the triangles in our mesh. Okay, so at the minute, all of our triangles are just being given a random color, but we might want to figure out how to shade our triangles using flat shading where each polygon's colour depends on its direction from the light. Ok, so here's the basic rule with shading. At the same light intensity, each polygon is illuminated most brightly when it is facing the direction of light. Essentially, if I hold a light directly in front of a flat surface, it will be at its brightest. If I hold a light directly to the side of a flat surface, it will get no illumination. And if I hold it at an angle, it will be somewhere in between. One great bonus of this is that if our light intensity value is negative, it means that the light is coming from behind the polygon, and therefore the polygon is invisible. Since we don't need to render invisible things, we can just simply delete them before we actually render them. This is called backface culling. Okay, so you can't see it on this model since it's convex, but for concave models, we see artifacts where triangles are not drawn in the correct order. The polygons are still drawn to the screen since they still face the screen and therefore the back face colouring doesn't work, uh, but there's nothing to tell the computer to not render them because they're behind other polygons. Luckily, there's a fix to this with a process called hidden face removal, which requires something called the Z buffer. It will stop the computer from drawing polygons on top of one another. The Z buffer is a two dimensional array, X and Y, that stores the Z value of each screen pixel. It can be displayed as a texture, often called a depth texture, where the darker a pixel is, the further away it is from the camera. The computer can check the Z value of each pixel as we render each polygon. If the Z value for a pixel is smaller than the current Z value, it means that the new pixel is in front of the previous one, so we draw the new pixel to the screen. Just like how this green triangle's Z depth is smaller, so we draw it in front of the blue triangle. However, if the Z depth of the same pixel is larger than the previous Z depth, it means that it's behind those polygons, and so we don't draw it in front. Just like this yellow square is behind the blue and green triangles. This helps fix our issues with concave shapes as all of our hidden faces are removed. Okay, so at this point we might feel satisfied with what we have. If you are, you shouldn't be. We have completely forgotten about the third dimension until this point except for in the Z buffer, where we did use the third dimension. That's right folks, all of these triangles which we've been rendering, it's all been 2D. We have quite literally just taken the X and Y coordinate for our model and just forgotten about the Z. Once again, except for the Z buffer. Essentially what this means is that the image on our screen is an orthographic view and has no depth at all. We want it so that things further away from the camera will appear smaller, just like in real life. In order to do this, we need to apply some perspective. To apply perspective, we need something called a frustum. This is a shape which we view all of our objects inside of. It has a near plane, which is what we project our objects onto, and a far plane. Anything past the far plane will not be rendered. Now, the projection matrix for 3D is kind of really complicated and it's a bit beyond both this video and the amount of time I have to try and understand it, so I'm going to simplify it with an example in 2D, where we're going to figure out how to project onto our 1D near plane. Let's have a look at our example, where YS is going to be the perceived height of our tree on our near plane from the viewpoint. 
We know that the side lengths of both the small and big triangle are proportional to one another. So in order to find ys, we can use the following equation. This shows that the apparent height of the tree, ys, is equivalent to the distance to the near plane, n, multiplied by the object's true height, y, and then divided by the distance to the object, which is z. Let's imagine a more simple example, where we want to find out where this point would appear on our near plane from the camera's position at the origin. So we use the camera's distance to the near plane, which is 2 in our case, and multiply it by the object's true height, which is 3.5. Then we divide it by the distance to the object, and we find our perceived height is 1. If we check this by drawing a line, yep, 1. So in order to do this for every object on our screen, we would literally just do this for every vertice on every object on our screen. Awesome, so in order to do this in 3D, the use of the perspective projection matrix is helpful. Unfortunately, I've never done anything matrix maths before. I remember it being mentioned in my A-level, but then our exams were cancelled, so we just didn't bother. It's a whole topic that could be talked about for days. My point is, is that I don't get this next bit yet. Maybe in a year or two I'll come back and cringe at that and leave a pinned comment explaining it better, so check the comments if you're in the future. In the meantime, please just check out this video from someone who seems to explain it much better than I ever could. Anyway, here's a quick comparison of the two projections next to each other on our mesh. Notice how the glasses seem larger compared to the head due to them being closer to the camera in the perspective mode. And here's a comparison of the two projection types in a scene with a lot more depth, just to drive home how much of a difference this makes. Okay, I'm all a bit mathsed out now, and the summer ended, so now I have to do actual work instead of my own self-imposed made-up work. Very sad. I just want to give a massive thanks to Dmitry V. Sokolov and the Tiny Renderer Projects for providing these amazing resources for free. They're amazing to learn from, and I highly recommend going through their lessons if you want to know more, even if you don't make it all the way through. As well as this, I have tried to link all of my resources in the description, since they're all much better and deeper explanations than what I said. So thank you very much for watching, I hope you at least learned a little bit about how computers render images to our screens. If you enjoyed, please feel free to subscribe, and of course, have a nice day.